All right, so um, we're at an interesting stage where we're preparing final preparation of the water marketing strategy document. Uh, and so uh, we have, as uh, committee members will remember, we went through the elements of that document that have completed, that have been completed last month. Um, and that was sent out for comment and we have received comments back that we uh, hope to share with you today and then uh, see if any of those comments are um, grounds for discussion. So if there's any of those that the committee would like to discuss in more detail. Um, we also want to give you an update. You know, the goal obviously of, um, of drafting the final document, including the legal documents is to create an opportunity uh, if a GSA were to elect to do so, um, to actually conduct a couple of auctions in October and November to true up the previous water year's water supply, um, uh, you know, in case uh, sort of do a, a real modest uh, test of the market structure. Um, and so in the service of that, we're working on um, elements beyond the water marketing strategy document, elements like uh, you know, more specific definition of triggers, modification of trading zones, you know, the actual specific administrative details of elements of things covered in the document. Um, and so we wanna give you some updates um, about work that's being done in that regard as well. Um, so uh, any comments? Uh, or questions from committee members before we jump into uh, today's agenda. All right, I, not hearing any comments, I'll uh, assume that we can uh, continue. All right, and so in terms of uh, recapping last month's meeting, committee meeting, um, last month we, uh, gave committee members a uh, recap of the public workshop that had been conducted on May 20th at Self-Help Enterprises. That was where we presented the entire outline of the water market version 1.0 uh, to the public. Uh, and so we recapped that public workshop meeting. Um, we also talked about dra dr a draft trigger definitions in particular a draft trigger definition for the disadvantaged community trigger. So just to put all of this in context, as committee members know, we have um, that one of the elements of the water marketing strategy is to, is to uh, produce rules uh, and operating mechanisms that will seek to mitigate adverse impacts of market transfers of pumping um, to the basin generally and to disadvantaged communities. And so we have a minimum threshold trigger where, so first of all, we've carved up the, the, uh, the basin into trading zones, roughly following the original analysis zones used in the uh, GSPs. Uh, and then we have two different triggers that will result in restrictions on trading. One trigger related to disadvantaged communities, one trigger related to groundwater levels um, generally, and in particular in relationship to the minimum threshold. And so um, we talked about a draft trigger definition for disadvantaged communities. And the proposal was to find the closest unconfined representative monitoring well for each disadvantaged community in the basin. And then it was to set a protective depth for each, each disadvantaged community well uh, and that protective depth would be 30% of well depth. So in other words, it would be 30% above the bottom of the well. And that a, a study would be done relying on water year 2022's fall groundwater level data to try and find what the relationship is between a disadvantaged community's uh, well depth and water levels in the closest representative monitoring well. And the idea was then to set the trigger to make sure that disadvantaged community wells would stay 30% above the bottom, but we would actually monitor that in the closest representative monitoring well. Uh, and so there's an update, um, uh, that work has been updated um, and, uh, and um, so there's an item 
uh, at the very end of the agenda addressing that. Um, so the, the um, engineering team continues to work on the specific definition of those uh, locations, those wells and those triggers. Um, the biggest thing we did last committee meeting was to actually walk through the elements of the water marketing strategy document. Um, again, we'll be reviewing the comments that we've received thus far on those chapters. And then also we gave an update on the water accounting dashboard integration with the trading software. Uh, and um, to this uh, point, the water accounting dashboard has now, uh, so Scott Steinbeck, who runs uh, the water accounting dashboard, has now built data streams so that the two pieces of software can begin talking to each other. He's also now working on creating the new function um, which is uh, what we've been referring to as the transfer bucket, right? That's the area in the water kind of dashboard where a uh, water user, a grower can choose to move water into the water available for trade column so that it then is available for sale uh, in the in the trading software. Uh, and so that function is is uh, in the process of being built now, but there have been there has been significant progress made in that integration since our last committee meeting. And with that, um, we're gonna start talking about, uh, so first of all, any comments or questions about uh, um, the last month, what's transpired, what we talked about at the last committee meeting? All right, then I'm gonna pass the baton to Candriel. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, so as you all may remember from my thousands of emails, uh, we recently asked for comments on the main strategy document as well as the legal documents that support chapter six, um, asking for substantive, editorial, um, all of the above type of comments, looking for all of the areas of improvement that you see within the document. Uh, we received comments back from Mr. Wallace, Mr. Nichols, and Ms. Sanchez. Um, as far as what we're doing with those comments, we've set up a comment spreadsheet um, and we're cataloging those comments um, by document, by subsection, by person, as well as whether it's a substantive or editorial comment and how we're going to respond and integrate that comment into the document or the, the main document or the legal documents. So we wanted to take some time today going through that catalog with you of comments and note what we've received so far, let you know some of our preliminary responses as we're beginning to move through those and integrate them into the documents and get a discussion going to see if there's any uh, additional commentary that folks would like to make or if anybody um, has any ideas that are spurred just bouncing off of the comments that have already been submitted. So if you don't mind, I'm going to steal the screen from you in just a second, Matthew. Great. Uh, and so as Candriel is setting up, um, so you see here just a screenshot from the spreadsheet that she will be um, walking us through, which catalogs all the comments. Uh, and um, so that you're aware, once this PowerPoint presentation is available, um, you will have a link here on this slide to the Dropbox folder where you can access this file that Candriel is going to share. Is this everybody that's on? Or is it just? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right, let me move you all over here. Okay, so. Hey, Matthew. Yes, I didn't. Hey, Chris. I didn't introduce myself when you guys first started. I just kind of got into the room, and I heard. Right. That. So, just I'm Chris Hunter, um, Assistant General Manager to Linmore Irrigation District, and Program Manager for East Korea. Just excellent. Here. Hey, and actually, Chris, you've highlighted an oversight on our part, which is we didn't ask folks online uh, to introduce themselves. So, why don't we give folks a moment to follow mm -hmm. Chris? Um, Jasmine, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, 
Sorry, I was muted. Um, I am Jasmine Rivera, Community Development Specialist with Self-Help Enterprises. Great, thank you. Natalie? Hey everyone, this is Natalie. I'm a water policy Natalie. with Leadership Council. Excellent, thank you, Natalie. Stephanie? Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie Mercado. I'm also with Self-Help Enterprises and I'm also a Community Development Specialist. Excellent. Sonia? Hi everyone, I'm Sonia Sanchez. I'm a Senior Community Development Specialist and I'm on the committee. And we have um, Stephanie We can't hear you. Yep, Sonia, we're at, we, so, so that's Sonia Sanchez. She's a committee member from Self-Help Enterprises. She's new to our team and she's listening in just for informational purposes and kind of learn about water markets. Hey, and Sonia, just so we know, we, we only caught about the last sentence of, of what you just said right there. So the audio is going in and out. Matt Watkins, do you want to say hello? Hello, everybody. Matt Watkins, uh, B Sweet Citrus, uh, East Kuia representative. Awesome. Is there anyone we missed? Just me, Stephanie Ruiz from Greater Kuia. Stephanie, all right, great. Thanks for joining us. And I joined here at the Irrigation Irrigation District. My name is Kelsey Leindecker, and I live in Miss Kuia. Excellent. All right, take it away, Kendra. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, the way we're going to move through this comment spreadsheet is I'll read out what we received, who we received it from, and on which document. Um, we'll go through any preliminary responses that we have to said comments, and then give the mic to all of you to see if there's anything else that you'd like to say um or anything any other ideas that this spurs and just make sure that we're covering all of our bases here and ensuring that everybody's voices are completely incorporated uh so first I mean, i'm the best in the t and d office um i don't know speaking to anybody else i can't read any of the institution we can't either <laughs> well, i can print out a few we have a document i think we have she just scrolls back and forth. Is that better? Oh, yeah. Right on. Uh, I'll just scroll over. Okay. So first up on the main document, um, Mr. Wallace mentioned that Lewis Creek and Fraser Creek should be included as additional runoff services sources. Excuse me. Um, are there any other runoff sources that anybody is aware of, or does there any anyone who disagrees with this addition? Um, and um, Kendra, will you slide over to the right so they can see um, the comment that's being so? This is the Kauia Subbasin Overview Chapter, Chapter One Point One, and the second reference is this one: ephemeral watersheds that contribute surface water supplies include. And there's the list. So this is one we would encourage you to think about um, um, as you look at the uh, Kauia Subbasin overview. Is there any are there any water sources that we have left out? All right. Uh, second question or second comment um, in the allocation matrix in chapter three, um, there is a comment about water credits. Uh, for East Kauia, surface water credits to a landowner from an irrigation district can be carried on their account with no time limit and transfers will be allowed inside the individual irrigation district per the district's rules where the credit was obtained. 
Currently no transfer of surface water credits allowed outside of the individual irrigation districts, but LSID is looking into this option. Any preliminary thoughts, committee members, Matthew? And here, what I um, just to put this in context, uh, you know, this and the comment that follows um, highlights that since we originally created the um, the uh, allocation matrix, you know, more than six months ago, there have actually been um, some changes to the specific allocation systems um, employed in uh, one or more of the GSAs, and so. This is sort of highlighted that um, that allocation matrix might be out of date, uh, and so, in particular, if you are a representative of one of the uh, GSAs, uh, or obviously a water user in a particular GSA, we'd strongly encourage the committee to go back through and look at that allocation matrix, and bring to our attention any additional. Um, uh, corrections that need to be made to reflect changes to how those allocation systems are being implemented. And so with that, um, if anyone has any comments, we welcome them now. This was all related to surface water, not? Um, obviously in the, uh, in the allocation matrix, you have foreign water, uh, salvage water and native. Uh, and so, yes, uh, in this case, these are related to surface water credits, which become part of that groundwater allocation. So if I'm understanding, this is saying, getting back the point of currently, mid Korea is not allowing transfers outside of their GSA, but this is saying, let's look at the possibility of doing that, of being able to transfer, or is that not what this is talking about yet? Are you talking about number four, Dana? Um, number three. Number three. Number three, okay. As reference, the comment is talking about the allocation metric matrix. Yeah, and so I think this this simply refers to irrigation, you know, rules applying to transfers, you know, non-market transfers within irrigation districts, you know, and so I guess one place where this might interface with market transfers is that we have limited an individual to um, uh, uh, transfers, transferring an amount of allocation up to 10 inches per acre. Uh, and but we've been agnostic to which flavor of water they're trading. Um, and so obviously here we would need to make sure that someone has 10 inches of um, of uh, available allocation that is not um, the surface water credits generated through an irrigation district because uh, if they if they had used all of their other types of allocation, we would need to um, deploy the geographic restrictions that the water district employs. That was my, how I interpreted this comment. Okay, not hearing any additional comments. Uh, the comment right after is very similarly linked in the allocation matrix. Um, have you had the opportunity yet? Um, oh, Craig's not actually in the room. Craig's not with us. Yeah, he's not with us. Darn. I was hoping to get additional feedback. Well, then I will follow up with Mr. Wallace on the two items that he wanted to check on and see if there's any additional feedback to incorporate there. Matthew? Yes. <laughs> I don't want to interfere with the committee. So are you looking for comments from the public also or just committee? Sure. No, 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 no. Anyone can make it. We welcome all comments. Okay. Uh, to Mr. Wallace's comments, I think, Matthew, you're correct by saying you just need to kind of retouch base with the GSA's rules and regulations. Um, the CDP contractors have rules that from their 90 contracts that that surface water cannot leave 
district boundaries. Yeah. But for entities like Wachumna or other private ditch companies, those rules may or may not apply depending upon that entity. So I yeah. think he's just referencing. Yeah. Okay. And this actually is, so thank you for that, uh, Chris. This also is an issue we talked about um, when we were trying to determine how much we would allow individuals to uh, offer for sale in the formal market. Uh, and part of the reason we chose that 10 inches, we originally said, well, maybe we should say you can only trade native because that's the flavor of water that everyone has. Um, there's some accounting challenges with that um, because of the way the water accounting dashboard works. And so our fallback was to say, well, we'll just trade 10 inches, an amount equivalent to your native, um, since hypothetically, uh, since everyone should have 10 inches. So, so it does, it is a reminder to us that, that um, you know, especially if we do um, a, a small test this uh, fall, that it will be really interesting to um, make sure before doing that, that we're uh, sensitive to all of these boundary issues. Kendra, do you want to jump on five? Yeah. So five is about, excuse me, five is about chapter five, uh, specifically a subsection on the measurement of monitoring water use. Um, the content reference talks about measurement errors within a study that was used to supplement uh, the content that we created for the document. Um, I think you have a preliminary comment on that, Matthew, but specifically Mr. Wallace doesn't think that land IQ should be incorporated into this. Yeah, yeah. and this um, actually, I think it was, um, um, I believe it was Chuck Nichols makes a similar comment below, which is worthwhile. Uh, and, and in that, his I actually think um, requ requires um, it actually suggests removing some of the text from um, a similar section. Um, but in the response to um, Craig's broader comment is that what we're what we're doing here is we're this is part of a um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is the uh, existing markets chapter. Uh, and so this is re collecting information, making reference to other people's studies of water marketing strategies that are employed. And so here, this is just, we're directly quoting from a large meta-analysis. So one thing is, this is not directly an attack on Oman ET whatsoever. We are quoting directly from a study that did a meta-analysis of um, multiple existing remote sensing platforms and did find measurement areas across the board. So the comment is not meant to be specific to Oman ET. Um, actually, maybe in this context, Kendriel, it would be useful um, to jump down. Um, let's see if I can find that other comment quickly in my own document. Um, so line 24, um, Chuck Nichols makes a related comment. Um, if you want to jump down to that, With so uh, oh, uh, sorry. Look, look one one row up, twenty three. Does this section need to be rewritten in light of Land IQ's subsequent improvement to satellite remote sensing? Now, if you go to the um, right, um, so Chuck called out a, an even bigger one, and I agree here um, that. Uh, I don't think it's inappropriate to quote Foster, but it, the entire first few sentences noting um, our test of open ET against in situ metering, I think is worth striking. And so our plan is to strike everything um, down um, to where it says Foster at all 2021, that would all um, come out um, because I uh, to try and you claim that open ET says anything about land IQ, I think is a fair criticism. Does anyone have any opposing viewpoints or is this an acceptable fix? What's the fix? 
So we'll pull out all the references to OpenAT and all we'll do is we'll just um, um, provide a small summary of Foster et al, which was this meta-analysis in the context of the of the of that you know, remember this is the research part of the report where we researched other strategies. So in fact, if it's helpful, Candriel, for just, um, you can select from the word the all the way down to foster at all 2021. Uh, let's see. And you could just put a strike through just so we make a note that, um, or turn it red. Yeah, whichever is easier. <laughs> cool. I'm in Excel. I don't have all the functions. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Why don't you go back up? Okay. Uh, chapter six, um, Mr. Wallace comments on the role of the exchange administrator and particularly the format of the bidding. He specifically says that um, we require a little bit more clarity around the asking price proposed by the seller um, and the minimum price set by the system. He specifically says, can they set a minimum price point that the system would not allow an offer below that point? Uh, Matthew, is that a possibility? Is that something? Yeah. And yep. So, so this ahead. highlights this highlights an oversight in the way that this particular section is written. Um, so the seller must submit a minimum price, what we would call the reservation price, as part of the bid, and no match can occur at a price below that minimum price, right? And again, in many cases, it'll match substantially higher. And so that is spelled out in a different section of the document, but that's a great reminder that. Um, we need to spell it out each time that we refer to it. Um, so it's in the rules and regulations, but we need to make sure that's also clear here as well. While we're on the topic, is there anyone on the committee or otherwise that still requires clarity about the bidding structure? I think I had a comment I had there that referred to algorithm. And but it never specifically discussed it in the committee, but it never actually said what the process was. So at least nowhere that I can find. I think my comment was similar in the same vein, that it needs to be pretty clear um, what this algorithm is that people are participating in. You bet. Yeah, that's that's great feedback. And so again, it's it's spelled out in rules and regulations, and it was talked about in that context. But but we need to spell it out anytime we make reference to it, um, so that there's no ambiguity. I must have missed it. I went through the whole thing. I couldn't find it. Next comment, still on chapter six. Uh, it's relating to eligible eligible market participants and what they can sell up to per acre. Uh, the comment says, we may need to clarify if an irrigation district or water company shareholder is selling on behalf or in benefit of an entire district. It may not be tied to an acre feet per acre. Yeah, Any and so again, this highlights again, where, where we'll need something may be spelled out in one part of the document, but not made clear throughout. Um, which is that as we have, as the committee has um, thought about it, and I and I welcome um, disagreement from any committee member whose understanding is different, um, is that the eligible parties are landowners who have a GSA allocation and who are in compliance with all agency rules and regulations are eligible to participate. So it's an individual landowner who has a GSA allocation. So we had actually not imagined um, initially that irrigation districts and water company shareholders would participate unless they are landowners, individual landowners who have a GSA allocation. Um, is that consistent with the, the, the committee members understand? That's, that's what's explicit, what we explicitly discussed in previous meetings. I wanna make sure that there's no, since Craig was in some of those meetings, 
I want to make sure that there wasn't isn't a broader misunderstanding. So any well, comments from committee yeah. members? Some of them pension funds or some other things where they play own land. I can't imagine it's a signal company. And TID probably owns some funds as well. So would they be eligible up to the point you know, if it was 100 acres, they would be more than 10 inches per acre? Acres the same as any other landowner. So I think that's the question that's asked. Yep, that's a great. Um, okay, so so what do you think, Chuck? What do I think? Yeah, um, I think it's really a diminutive mess of nothing. Yeah, and, it, and it Chuck, I'm hearing about move. half of the words you're saying. Uh, is there? Can we pull a microphone closer to you? Yeah, I think it's a, it would be a diminutive mess of See any reason to exclude, exclude them because if they're landowners, um, they should be able to follow all the rest of the rules on this. And, and, okay, but okay. then, uh, but then, Chuck, I assume then that they, again, they then they would be offering for sale or purchasing water in units of an acre foot, right? Uh, so is there so if 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 a water district or another body can be a landowner who has GSA allocation, then they would fit with that definition of who's eligible. Is there any reason why they couldn't? We can't hear you. No, it just touched that bit, and so all it took was to turn it off. Kandria, were you able to hear me? Yeah, I think it's just okay. a disconnect in the room. Okay. But I don't want to assume. Chris, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I hear both of you very well. I'm I'm having issues with the TID also. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Kendra, can you hear us now? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Oh, so they can hear us, but we can hear them. Yes, oh. and actually, oh, yeah. so, it might be an option. Okay, Kendra. Um, can you say something? Yep. Yep. How do now. how do we sound? No, we say Diana? Okay. She said that. Give me one second. Let me just turn it back on. Okay. Oops. That doesn't change. I think. No. Yeah. Could you go ahead and press the the off button? Yeah. Can you press the off button? This guy. Yes. Hold it. Did yours turn off? Yeah, so we can hear you still, Diana. Okay, we can now hear you again. Can you hear us? Okay, great. Yes, and actually, so we heard everyone clearly with Chuck. Uh, we only heard about half of what he said. Is there a way to move a microphone just a little bit closer to Chuck? That's yeah. what I was doing when I broke it. <laughs> <laughs> great. Hey, so Chuck, I heard you say... Uh, that as long as um, an irrigation district or another organization is a landowner with a GSA allocation, they should qualify under the standard eligibility rules. Uh, and I don't see any problem with that whatsoever. Um, in regard to Craig, can you address Craig's don't question? Is there any, oh, is there any reason they, yeah, go ahead. 
I was the one who caused the disruption. I apologize. Um, my question is, is we're tied to the dashboard. So if you're an irrigation district, are you on the dashboard as being able to um, participate as a landowner? And if, if not, then I do not think they should be able to trade. It's a great question. Diana, do you so, know? So sorry for joining hey, late, Greg. but so the district is a landowner. We are on the dashboard, so the participation, I don't think is an issue there. But to Sophie's last point, one other issue, the district, or at least my district, is going to have way more credits potentially tied to some smaller acreage, but it's really on behalf of all landowners. So I don't like a limitation on what we're allowed to potentially sell out because if you base it on our acreage size, it may be a limitation. Um, and then an irrigation district, if they have credits on behalf of all their landowners anyway, that may not be a landowner, I think we would still need to address that because if the district's trying to market credits for the benefit of all of them, whether revenue or some otherwise, Hey, there and might Craig, just can... be a special case for a, for a district, but we are a land we are a landowner, we are on the dashboard, so that issues we check those boxes anyway. Great. Hey, Craig. So one question I had is um, is there would a a district potentially participate only as a seller, or might they be a seller and a buyer? Just out of curiosity. Our district probably won't ever be a buyer like the district itself, but I can imagine other districts that maybe have some pumping they'd like to do on behalf of the district or something else may want to be a buyer, but I, I can't speak okay. for the others. I just know for really our district, I can't see us ever being a buyer. Okay. Credits. And how are those, uh, how is that allocation generated by the district? Is this, are, is this foreign water? And then would, um, obviously we would, I, if the answer is yes, the second follow-up question is then, uh, will we have to be really sensitive to uh, district boundaries as you mentioned above in a previous comment? Well, we have allocated of native obviously on the land we own. So that's a no brainer. We don't have any tier one or two or other allocations because we're not irrigating typically the land the district owns. Um, so yeah, there is some foreign water credits, but there's also in LSID's case, there's salvage water credits or ditch losses for Bochumna. So that doesn't have the same limitations on that surface water bucket that a Friant derived credit may have. So. Okay. So that I'm curious. Go ahead, Sophie. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure how to not interrupt people when they talk since we're sitting at a table. I'm not trying to be rude. What my concern is, is there are potentials for a lot of unintended consequences with this new ripple. And it makes me concerned that we're just going to decide on it before we do some studying on the what ifs. Because we know, uh, Matthew, from you and I getting together um, and talking with the other uh, marketing group that we talk to the, the, the what is really make a difference so it's better for us to address them now not later yeah so i guess that then um the question for the committee is is there any reason why in the first year we would consider waiving that limit an irrigation district could still participate but they'd be limited to 10 inches of native you know an amount equivalent to 10 inches to their native allocation as we uh test the market. Is there any reason why we would relax that uh, cap on what they're allowed to transfer through the market? They could still do it through just by submitting transfer forms to the GSA because that's already permitted. Um, Sophie, what's your, uh, I, it sounds like you're saying no, we, in the first year, we wouldn't entertain relaxing that. We should impose the rule and see how it goes. Start looking at the, the unintended consequences if, you know, 
uh, irrigation districts all got together, that would be the end of the small farmer. And that's exactly what happened over in Fox Canyon. So I'm concerned about that without looking at it. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, oh, I would tend to agree. I mean, if only if it's the ground that they actually, they're paying the taxes, man, you know, their ATM, they can do all to them, whatever, that's one thing. But to do it on behalf of their people within their district, I'm I'm totally opposed against against that. Okay. 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 You got to so remember that the district acquires ditch losses in Wachumna that are not the individual landowners currently right now. So our board, as of now, is wanting to. Do something with that potential on behalf of all landowners. If there's a problem. And I think the at least as far as the East Quia goes, the pumping cap limitations they have in place and having to have the final say on to alleviate any potential impacts on where or where not the credits may be get moved to. Well, the thing is, is the limitations that are placed. How do you know if you're if you're having an effect on certain areas and zones and so on, mm -hmm. district wide? How how do you how do you constrain that? And so I I, I just I, I think it's just throwing a whole, whole new wrinkle in the thing right now. We don't need that right now. We're trying to get this market going. I agree. Hey, and so Craig, um, is there so we uh, is the district planning to do transfers just using the, the current out of the market then? Say, say that again, Craig. I said, so if that limitation would be in place, then we could potentially be part of the pilot market to market native water or whatever we might have on our own land. But yeah. the other credits you're saying wouldn't be eligible to be moved. So we would just use the East Quia rules and move it that way. I, I guess that's... I mean, we're either trying to make it work or not. I think the safeguards in place kind of limit what could get moved to a certain area anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, the other one to keep in mind is that that this committee is going to is trying. One of our guiding principles is uh, is proposing a single set of rules that can be implemented um, basin wide uh, that wouldn't prevent East Kauia from taking the strategy document and saying, yeah, you know, you know, we think we want to um, deviate from that. Um, but but I, I have heard throughout this entire process repeatedly committee members emphasize the importance of starting smaller, starting simple, learning as we go, um, and then considering greater complexity over time. Craig, I don't really care you know, one way or the other, but the simple fact is if it's a district, then you don't have a geographical location that you're giving up pumping credit from. And the whole framework on this entire document is based upon that. So I don't see how you do it, at least initially. It's an interesting comment. See, isn't that exactly? It, it'd be, it'd be from our management area, which is what the Quia is, the, what the East Quia would be monitoring or whatever threshold regions in it. Like I said, I don't, I don't see us transferring pumping credits within our district. How's that? I mean, unless it's extreme dry years and some of our landowners would need something, but they should have enough of their own this would be transferring it out just like any other individual landowner would be to where as long as it's not impacting the area they're trying to move it to. Well, Matthew, you, it, it's, it's lands that have a, a, it's a landowner, but it's also lands that have the allocation. Does that mean, because everyone gets native, it's right. you're given. However, not everyone gets the transitional pumping. And on East Korea's rules and regulations, uh, only irrigated lands are in transitional pumping. Okay. So 
um, tell me how that uh, affects. So are you, so what do you think about the prospect of an irrigation district transferring allocation beyond 10 inches times the number of acres the district owns? Well, if the district owns lands that happen to be irrigated lands, then they are within the program. But if it's not, it's just canal or just empty lot. Uh, it's yep. not, it's not. And would they not receive, so would a district receive allocate, allocation for land they own that is not irrigated? Yeah, this district receives native, they just don't receive penalty water. We're not talking about having to be irrigated land to transfer credits. Yeah, that's new to me. So Diane, I don't quite understand why, whether it's irrigated or not, would affect what an irrigation district can transfer. Can you elaborate? Well, I, I remember that the eligibility was the landowner and that you get an allocation. Whenever at mid career, whenever we say you have an allocation, we're talking about our 2.5. However, not everyone gets that 1.66 after 10, after yep. the native. Yep, sure. And that's that was partly why we chose that 10 inch level, because that's the minimum that everybody gets. And so here, the proposal would be that under the eligibility rules, we've already defined that you must be a landowner who receives a GSA allocation. You would be allowed to sell up to 10 inches for each acre that you own that, that receives an allocation. Okay, so everyone. Yes. And that's not what you just read for these. Groups. Right, well, the, the allocation, the transitional pumping, is only for irrigated land. And whenever I think of allocation, I think of the, all three GSAs have, you know, that after 10 inches allocation. So I thought uh, that it was all stuck on people that are within the penalty fees and uh, what the water dashboard was meant for. Hey, uh, Kendra, can I share my screen real quick? Go for it. So here is the allocation matrix that we put together. And again, admitting that Craig and others have already identified that there's some things that are out of date now. But what you see here on the left is that we have a total pumping cap that does vary by agency. So 2.7 and greater, 2.5 and mid only 1.15 in east. And then we have this column here, native yield. And all three GSAs provide at least 10 inches per acre of native yield. And so the rules as we've currently written them provide that anyone who owns land and receives that 0.83 or 0.85 acre feet per acre can sell up to an, uh, that amount conditional on, first of all, they're eligible if they're in compliance with all agency rules and regulations and conditional on the fact that they actually have that allocation still available. So Diana, does uh, that's the 10 inches we were referring to. So can right. you explain it again what your... Um, critique was? Well, I'm going through East Korea's eligible land approved under any of those requests will be deemed irrigated land. I, I was just trying to go through the East Korea's rules and regulations to see what is eligible land because they native is given to all eligible land. I was trying to see. Yeah, so we might, so by the way, let's, I'm trying to think. So it might be that the word eligible there is different than the word eligible here. So one of the uh, what ifs that, yeah, this is one that came to mind. What if 
the water in the pond is actually uh, counted as native, but that water is being held for other people. So it's not native on that ground. It's going to be shipped all over. What is the consequence of that? They're not really giving up their 10 inches or trading their 10 inches because it's not really theirs anyway. They put it in a pond. I think, Sophie, what they're saying, though, is that like Tulare Irrigation, if it owns 100 acres, it's getting 10 inches on each of those acres that it owns. It's got 83 acre feet that it could put in the water market subject to the geographical limitations that it includes. Right, correct. But where so, did that occur? So if it, if it owns 100 acres, well, to Larry well, Irrigation so could so sell 83. They're not going to be able to move it around. That's the whole point of having the irrigation district set ponds. They're not moving surface water. They're pumping water. The same as this. OK. Help me understand then, because I'm missing it. If you, if I have ponds, for example, okay, so I take more of the water and I put it in those ponds than would be per acre. You're, you're only going to get the 0.8 for whatever for the what's in you know what would have landed in the pond needs to be rainfall. Maybe you you can do you know whatever you want with the water in your ponds, as long as you comply with the groundwater okay. program requirements, right? Okay. TID very likely is not gonna grow anything in one of their ponding basins. Right. So it's gonna sit vacant. Um, and if if there's they're in a zone that allows transfers, right. they should be allowed to transfer it if they're next to a back and that's an area that's impacted then you can't it's it, they follow the same rules as the guy farming okay. uh, corn across the street so that's all i was saying right yeah, there it's, it's no different than it has happened. i got i got canals run along our we can see what she on our farm you know people running the water the ditch area is ours i get credit for that as you know as part of my ranch it's part of the APN. i pay tax on it i get paid jets even though there may be water running through that ditch you know, it's my part of my acreage. And does the ditch company get uh, credit too? No, no. The only thing they don't get is for the water thing, but they don't get a because that's not their APS, that's not their acreage, it's mine. Yeah. yeah. And so, but you made some comments about, um, about small farmers. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if, if, if it's true that irrigation districts are going to be net sellers. Um, it's to the benefit of small farmers to have as many people willing to sell allocation as possible. I, I Now, accepting what you said earlier, obviously we need to protect against concentrations of pumping that are going to drive down water levels or the uh, underground or water levels in shallow municipal wells, but we have those protections. Um, I don't see irrigation districts you know, competing with small farmers for water unless they're going to be buy net buyers. Mike, do you see an issue with doing it this way the first year? For the first year, I don't see an issue with the tenant gap. If we want to move more, if someone has to move more, we'll use these squeal rules and just do it that way. Yeah. And then <laughs> after the plan done, yeah, we can expand it out to cover. What they're trying to do, if we're trying to do a market for everybody to use. Okay. Sure. All right. I just Great. talk about the obvious. Yeah. yeah. The district will have quite a few friends that really want one of their acreages yeah. on behalf of all land owners. So. Great. Kendra, do you want to pull up the spreadsheet again? All right, so it sounds like there needs to be, there doesn't need to be any modification to the rules since if they're a landowner and they receive an allocation of native yield, they would be allowed to sell an amount equivalent to that. Um, but all of the triggers and everything else um, would still um, be imposed. 
before we jump into the next comment, I see we had a couple of people join in the room. Do I see Joe Cardoza? I was well, some time ago, I was on my way here. And then I saw someone else join in the back with a hat. Um, sorry, I was tied up on another day. So. No worries. So, thank you. Okay. Still on chapter six. Uh, the next comment is about the timing of the setting and alleviation of uh, triggers. So we state in the document that trigger fur triggers will have groundwater level readings in fall and that uh, triggers will be lifted in spring with a spring reading or if a grower um, covers the cost of mitigation to alleviate alleviate that trigger. Um, Mr. Wallace commented that we possibly discussed um, allowing transfers out but not transfers in when uh, a trigger had been activated. Yep, as this was a great comment. So in the case of the minimum threshold trigger, that's exactly right, that it results in a directional restriction on trade. You can transfer out, but you can't trade in. We did discuss in the case of the disadvantaged community trigger that trading would cease uh, in that trading zone until it's mitigated in order to maximize incentives to engage in mitigation. So, um, so uh, this point makes a good point that we weren't clear enough in the document about what the committee had decided. So we'll change that to reflect that yes, the, the minimum threshold results in a directional restriction. Moving on to Mr. Nichols comments. Um, going back to the beginning of chapter six, uh, we talk about the different types of exchanges, types of markets, and his comment reflects that there needs to be more fl flexibility and transparency incorporated into the beginning of that section with a couple of recommendations on sp specific language that should be included. Um, a statement that- said, the the and think the principles in their flexibility and transparency, but I didn't see those. Yep. Yeah. So actually, you make a really good point, Chuck. It's almost like the that initial description of the market really needs to be annotated so that at each step, each mechanism, each rule, you know, I we should add in the title of the section which principles were employed in order to make decisions among the menu of options and then you know explain so you're you're right that uh, that the document doesn't yet contain that explanation of how the particular choice reflects the guiding principles so i that's definitely something that needs to be tightened up thank you uh, especially in terms of representing to for uh, posterity and representing to other basins why we made cho the choices that we did. So that's a great, it's great feedback. Okay, still on chapter six, um, talking about how information is broken out into the market match transactions and non-market reported transactions within the document. Um, this comment talks about the ability of the market to gather transactional information uh, as to the quantity and the date of the transactions that do not flow through the market. Um, I think Mr. Nichols, and correct me if I'm wrong, is looking for an explanation on why this information is important for the reader. Chuck, do you want to elaborate on your comment? My comment was, is anything, any transactions that go through the exchange need to be reported separately. Agreed. Both in price and quantity and timing. Yep. And any other um, transactions need to be reported in terms of quantity and timing. And price isn't really important because you don't know if it was between, you know, Joe was selling it to his brother or something else. It, they're not market transactions, but it's good information to know because you're not going to know if this thing is working if it's 
if 3% of the transactions are going through it, 97 are going off the books, you're not really solving any issues. So yep. I think it's really important to know the volume and the timing of those other transactions. But if you put prices on them, it's just going to confuse everybody. Fair enough, because they're not arm's length a, transactions. That, that, was, that was an opinion on what needs to be reported out. And I, I think, I think you bring up a good point, the market represents because the TSA, you're going to know what the transactions were you know, or a transaction how many say the, the price reported itself represents 15% of the transactions or 75% or whatever. And that's that that's all the way you can get to it. It kind of gives an indicator for the people that are doing things on the side, different what the market's saying, but those people that are doing these arm length transactions. Yeah, I don't think you can give it away from that. Like this is and it's more of a GSA issue than it is a market. I think it also it's a measurement of how how useful the marketplace is. You bet. And and uh, I have a question for the GSAs. Is is because. Uh, uh, is there even an attempt, like when someone submits a transfer form, is there even a place for them to record a price? Um, I understand, Chuck, your point is that it's not an arm's length transaction. You wouldn't know if the price is meaningful at all um, or what they're doing on the side to make up for va create value. Um, so I understand the price information w might be very misleading is there is it even being collected because uh, i wasn't sure that there would ever even be price on those non-market transfers as far as i as far as i'm aware of in the greater there is no price listed. i'm sorry they are or they're not uh, as far as i know there was no place that you list price right. the transactions that occur yep or, or, okay or, okay that's there. what i yeah, and on the east, I don't think there is either. Chris can correct me because I haven't really even seen. Okay. No, there's East Korea views it as a private transaction between two private parties. We just record the acre feet of transfer and type of water, no price. Great. Okay. Great. Okay. So Chuck, it'll be exactly as you're recommending. Um, so it, there that um, there will not be price information on those non-market transfers, just quantity and timing. All right, Kendra, you want to go to the next one? Yeah. Uh, still within chapter six, the next comment talks about, again, triggers, how groundwater levels will be recorded in the fall and notifications provided in December prior to the first auction of the water year. Um, I think Chuck doesn't think that there needs to be a specific date, more so a time frame to provide a little bit more flexibility to those responding to the triggers. Yeah, and I like it. Yeah, so in fact, the December was only there because um, the engineering team thought that was early December first would be the earliest that it can be notified. But there's, I, I agree with the comment. We don't need to put December. We can just say the as early as possible and no less than two weeks before a uh, auction, for example. Um, Chuck, how did, does 14 days prior to the first auction, does that seem reasonable? I, I, I'm sure, you know, it is what they say they can do the best. Yeah. They, um, you know, water levels are not that hard to determine and they're not all done on a single day, so. I think if you just reveal them as they go along, it will it will help people and plan better. Yep. Uh, because you find out that they they want to plan a winter crop, they don't know until the fifteenth of November that they can't uh, buy any credits for their area. They it just changes how they um, operate their farming. So yep. if it fall is pretty vague, but. You know, if if they know what the water levels are at the end of September, which is when most they do it to get the low waters, I, I don't know why it has to wait until November to find that yeah. out. 
Sure. So okay. That's, and again, uh, I, that's a GS. That's ultimately a GSA issue, right? When they all report those. Uh, right. Right. But I agree with you. The timber's kind of late if guys are trying to plant winter forage or something, and they don't know whether they can buy credits or not for their area. Yeah. Yep. Fair enough. Already in, in the greater, we're we're trying to we we are trying to set up a thing where we can take some ground out. Question is one. Problem is we don't even know how much funding we're going to have generating from this, this current year to be able to do this. Given that scenario, I mean, you know, it's again, it's that squeeze. You're trying to get it as soon as possible, but yet you don't want to stick your neck out and commit to something that you don't have the funding to suppress. So, there's just a general comment. Yeah, great. Yep, yep. it is well noted, and well, we will, uh, we will change December to as soon as possible. I had a long day in my pajamas reading and writing. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully a good pot of coffee. Okay, next comment uh, is on a 6.5, talking about, is in the content reference, um, that the market require evaluation and reauthorization on an annual basis to ensure the appropriate updated terms, standards, rules, and procedures are being incorporated. Uh, Chuck, he specifically said, when, are you talking about like when within the year that this happens or within any particular parameters? Annual basis is pretty vague. Um, and yeah. you know, when is the best time to do that? So then the summertime is, well, I don't have an answer to that. Yeah. There, so, it, so I have a suggestion. I, I was imagining October, November, because the goal is to reauthorize a market. And so obviously it's to collect as much information about the previous year's performance, about what actually happened the previous year. And then the idea is to reauthorize the market, employing any recommended changes so that you can do an initial auction sometime in December. And so maybe, maybe what you're getting at is maybe it Maybe there needs to be a sort of a mid-year check-in. How how are things going so far, so that some of the work's already been done when the, the end of year check-in happens, and recommendations can be expedited. Maybe vague is fine, but I just didn't understand when this was. Okay. The, I didn't understand what it meant. I didn't have okay. a solution. Okay. So the vision is to, at the end of the water year evaluate, update, reauthorize, and then be running by uh, mid-December. Again, that goes back to that situation, mid-December at that point, you're considering a winter crop and instead of a summer crop or something, they just basically nix that idea. Well, I think what Matt is saying makes sense. You know, this is the first market. Right. It's gonna run hopefully this fall sometime. I shouldn't be waiting till next October. I should really be looking at it. Sure. But the thing is, is I mean, soon as subsequent, the, soon as the rainfall, uh, yeah, but subsequent it. looking at December, it's too late to make that decision. As yeah. It's going to happen. Yeah. It's during the summer. Who knows? So, yeah. I don't, I don't have a answer to it. It's just whenever I read on an annual basis, it makes me nervous. Okay. So Kendra, we did this one, so you can jump down to the, the one below it. To move this out a bit. Okay. Uh, last comment on the full document, and then we'll move on to the legal documents. Um, talks about the entire section on protections against market power. Uh, the comment is that the algorithm should be included here. Um, because there's context lost uh, for the reader. Yep. Um, approximately how detailed would you think Chuck would be beneficial for the reader to see? And this is uh, existing markets, right? So this is the research part of the document, correct? Yeah. Kendra, five, yeah. Well, Again, this was going back to, I think, the model that you're looking at here is the same as it's being used in folks' canvas. 
So I don't know that it makes, you know, matters that we look at what, uh, you know, the South Platte is doing because we're not trading acres of corn. But it talks a lot about this Fox Canyon and it's the same thing that we're planning on implementing here. Um, and I still haven't seen the algorithm. I, I hear, you know, the highest is matched with the lowest and, but I, I don't, maybe, maybe you need more examples of that okay. on a piece of paper. Yeah. Uh, it shows how 10 hypothetical bids and offers would, yeah. how this algorithm would work um, so that I could wrap my arms around it and understand it. Great. That, that's where I was going with, with all of this, because um, I think you're going to, you're going to make a lot of farmers nervous when you start talking about algorithms. Um, okay. I'm not sure how to spell it. <laughs> I'm not either. Yeah. Okay. Good. Great point. Uh, and actually we, we have lots that's and lots of, of, of simple Excel examples that illustrate, you know, showing here's, six bids, three offers, here's how they would match. So I, I totally agree that we can uh, make that. And, and and it reveals just how straightforward and simple it is actually. So, um, yeah. so we, and it, um, I'm sure, you know, the familiar, familiarity breeds, you know, you know, contempt or whatever, but sure, you, you've looked at this for years and years and years. It's pretty new to those of us. Yeah, great. Yeah. So, uh, and in fact, at the next committee meeting too, we can do a, uh, we can walk through all those examples. Um, and then any alternatives to that? Well, yep. I think should be. You bet. And what's funny is we did, I, I, and I, I apologize, Chuck, I don't remember the context in which we did that because um, we actually did do pairs of examples comparing different pricing, midpoint, highest price, lowest price, different pricing strategies. Um, but it, but it may not have been a full committee meeting. It may have been, I don't remember the context in which we did it. So I'll, I'll go back through and- Yeah, summary of that, but I don't remember ever walking actually through. Okay, uh, so. great, good point. Yeah. I mean, I can envision it. I mean, where you're essentially where, when you start crossing out on little case, you have your highest and lowest and so on. And when you cross out of either the lowest or the highest and you go to the next person, then you got to get a blend from that until you pull tail team into the next threshold, whether it be high or low, and yeah. you're working your way to the, yeah. to the middle. Right, to the somebody's, middle. Yeah. Somebody's going to be running this. And yeah, well, on the other guy's going to call because he had well, to pay more than he did. Right, right. And then how is it that who gets dropped out? You know, who's who's left in the middle that doesn't get, anything. you know, anything, one way or the other, either a sell or a buy? Yep. Here yeah. So some example. I think you're right. Examples would be great. So we'll put that together. It would be a code, right, embedded in the. It is. It is. Yep. Algorithm. Mm -hmm. The technical folk call it code. Much <laughs> <laughs> And uh, and it, and then For actually, what's funny is. There were some other questions, Chuck. You had you had one here, jumping down to the to line sixteen. I, I assume there will be maximum offer prices. Uh, sorry, or not maximum. Well, there was one question you had about minimums. Um, let me see the one I'm talking about. So there were some other comments in other parts of the in the legal documents about the nature of the algorithm. And uh, and so just to address those broadly, and then and again we'll put together some examples. Um, the broad comment is you'll you can you're never asked to pay more than your the maximum price you set. You're never going to be asked to sell for less than your minimum. Um, that is uh, that can't happen. And obviously that wasn't clear enough in the the way the rules are written. Yeah, so you can, buy, and that's one of my comments. So you can ask for 500 and then say, but I'll willing to go down to three, but I don't want to get sell for less than that, right? So you set your minimum. I'm willing to sell for anything more than 300. And then again, the lowest offer is matched with the highest bid. 
and you get the midpoint. So in, in almost every case, you you get substantially more than your minimum. Because actually, if you think in terms of pricing theory, what we want to know, what we want to get market participants to reveal is what their reservation price is. What's their minimum price they're willing to sell for? And we also want to know what's the maximum a person is willing to buy for. And then we want to make them better off, right? We, we want to get do substantially better than those two prices. Do you want to start out with this last one since we're on that topic, Matthew? Um, let me see. Um, yep. Let me find my... Uh... It's another algorithm question that you probably yeah. covered with the example, so you don't need to do a, a satisfaction. Okay. Right on. Um, okay, so now we've moved on to the legal documents, starting out with the resolution to adopt the pilot market. Um, article six in that document talks about the conflicts and it says if a provision of this resolution conflicts with any other MKGSA action, the provisions of this resolution shall prevail. Uh, insert other irrigation districts here as needed. Um, do we need to clarify that EKGSA and GKGSA have separate transfer mechanisms um, with their own rules and regulations that will not be affected by the pilot program if a landowner decides to participate in both. Yep, yeah, so um, Craig, it would be great if East Kuya's attorney um, j would just suggest a, a couple sentences to, to insert. So I think that's that's reasonable yeah. addition. <laughs> Sorry, Craig, say that again. I said it's not like I haven't sent him the documents to review. Right. He just hasn't done it yet. So right, I'll and and point, point that out to him. Yeah, and we did have just so that everyone's aware, we did have mul we did have multiple meetings with the legal team, um, and then the legal team to decided that Valerie would do most of the heavy lifting and in the in, initial drafting and that they would review her work product. So um, so there's definitely room for improvements to the legal documents, but these should be understood as a joint work product of the three attorneys. So uh, for that one, for 10, great. So we can make an addition. For sure. Um, um, this, go ahead. Moving on to the participation agreement, there is a section on hold harmless and identification. Uh, it specifically talks about uh, accountability uh, in terms of the exchange administrator. And Chuck feels there needs to be more explicit um, and more detailed accountability included into that document for the exchange administrator. Is there any specific level of detail that you're looking for here, Chuck? Or is this just in no, general? That, that wasn't really the really the comment. If you're um the last sentence where the administrator is held harmless from gross negligence, that means they can do anything to anybody at any time and you have to sue them and that will get thrown in your face. So I don't think anybody should be um you know, excluded your to that level of negligence and yeah. not have any responsibility. Uh, You're absolutely, yeah. Hey, um, hey, Chuck, just- I don't, just, you I don't know. know who wrote that. I'm not blaming it on you, Craig, uh, but whoever, uh, you know, who are mad at whoever, whoever wrote it uh, may have had plans to be the exchange. <laughs> well, well, so, hey, Chuck, just so you know, so Valerie wrote that sentence um, and I think I have it here. Um, maybe she she needs to um, tighten it up, but it 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 was intended to say the opposite. Um, let me see if I can find that document because it actually says um, is what it what it's meant to protect is that the exchange administrator is protected from the gross negligence of a market participant, and a market participant is protected against the gross negligence of the exchange administrator. So that that sentence was intended 
to say, no, the exchange administrator is responsible, is liable for her own uh, or his own uh, negligence and the market participant is re responsible for her own or his own negligence. Uh, and so the intention was exactly what you're thinking. Uh, and so we will ask um, Valerie and the, the other attorneys to review that because um, that was the intention. And actually I do have it here. So it says here, so I'll read that sentence. The exchange administrator and the participant shall bear the responsibility for the consequences of their own willful misconduct, gross negligence, and breach of fiduci fiduciary obligations. So they will be, they will bear the responsibility for their own negligence. It says the participant, the participant shall in indemnify, defend, and hold hardless the exchange administrator for the participant's gross negligence. Okay. Uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll have the attorneys make sure that, that that's um, clear. Um, and this last comment is about the transaction costs of trades. Um, Chuck, do you think that it should be carried out in more detail in the main document, or are you looking for that content specifically to be added to this legal document or both? Wherever you think it needs to be included within the document, but I just think it needs to be included somewhere. Well, and currently we're planning to run the trial with uh, the run the test of the market without any transaction specific costs. It'll need to be in there someplace, sometime. We might sometime, yeah, decide. yeah, yeah. But I sort of feel like right. at the point at the point that that there that there are any service charge associated with it, that's then you're right. The committee will need to decide this, you know, how much those are, how they're. But we haven't. We've just said we're going to try and run a test and not charge. So, so I do agree that um, maybe the comment then needs to be future iterations may involve transaction or service related fees. Those will need to be specified at the appropriate time. And well, they probably should be on the website or where that transaction is going to occur so that they're, it's kept, uh, you know, it's right in front of them. So. Drug dealers give the first couple fixes away for free too. So. <laughs> hey, some sort of scope is it? Is it twenty percent? Is it two percent? At that level of strength. Right. I'm just looking for you know some sort of approximation when this does get to where it's revenue neutral. What are the transaction costs? Yeah. So it's, it's just going to be important just, for people looking into it when they're going into it. You bet. So, Chuck, just so you know, in Fox Canyon, it's 4%. 4%. Okay. Yep. Under 10%? You know, yep. some, somewhere in the, the comment or in the, the um, you know, the, the vision part of the document that, you know, the program, right. we want to have a program that's transparent and costs are under 6%. It's okay, the target. great. Awesome. Transparent. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Um, just to show folks, we did also catalog editorial comments uh, and those will be implemented. Don't really need feedback. Um, I think that is the end of the comment process. So as a next step, um, we're going to revise those chapters inclusive of your comments and along with updated chapters for those, we're hoping to send out chapters four and seven for a first draft review. Um, as far as your review is concerned, you don't need to do a detailed review of the chapters that you've already reviewed if you don't want to. All of the edits will be made and track changes so you can filter through and see exactly what was changed rather than read the entire thing in its entirety. What will need your 
complete review are chapters four and seven when we send those along with the updated one, two, three, five, and six. Is that something? Just for my, for my benefit, I didn't want to go in and change any text. I just put comments. Is that your preferred method of feedback? How, how do you want it? Uh, I, I like to make it as convenient as possible for whoever is doing the review. And if just putting in comments is most convenient for you, great. If you're somebody who likes to do track changes, that's also great. Um, all of the above, I will just synthesize everything into one updated document. Yeah, and, and I realize some people may not know what track changes is. There's a function, a button you can push in Microsoft or in Excel or in Word. And um, what it will do is it will make the change but it will say Matthew Fina proposed this change. And so we can always recover the original language. Uh, and so no, I, pers I personally like to work to making actual edits and track changes and making comments. Uh, and so any combination of those is great. So however you like to work, um, we are comfortable with. Okay. Um, is there anyone who did not have the opportunity to make any direct comments or edits to the main document or legal documents that did have comments that they want to make now? Bueller? All right. Then that cool. is it for the comments. Uh, we will let you know uh how we're going in terms of our progress implementing those comments and let you know as soon as we're able to send out an updated draft for your review back to you matthew um, and again just so everyone knows um you will have access to this um slide presentation after the conclusions meeting and there is a link here um, to go to the dropbox folder so you can and there you can find the actual native files themselves you can also find um the spreadsheet that we showed you with the um, uh, uh, with the comments. I see Natalie has her hand up. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, I had I've tried to access the Dropbox link that was shared, but it looks like it maybe is only like folks who have like the either the document was shared directly with them, like have access to them. I was curious if the draft chapters will be made available to the public for review. Um, or do y'all intend on doing that after having collected comments from the committee first? I think the latter. Uh, we want to make sure that the committee has the opportunity to steer us in the right direction um, based on the discussions that we've had over the last year to make sure that the document that gets presented to the public is its best fit for it as could be. Gotcha. Thank you. But obviously, we welcome input in commit in the committee meeting setting uh, and so uh, in fact there's at various stages where uh, public feedback has been incorporated the workshop public workshops as well all right so quick update so um that th the bulk of the work we wanted to do today was to get through the comments um, obviously maybe then before moving on we should just um state um, explicitly, it's never too late to make comments. So, um, so uh, if if you want to review a document that you've already seen after today's discussion and submit comments, we welcome that. So, um, there, uh, it's never too late. So, continue to provide um, feedback. You might talk to somebody or think of something you hadn't thought of before, uh, and so we continue to welcome uh, feedback of any kind. Um, the other thing we wanted to update you on was the definition of triggers, uh, and I and um, actually. I'm not super well prepared to um, give you a detailed update. Um, uh, and unfortunately, Aaron isn't here to present it, but Aaron has been working um, with the engineering team uh, and the definition of triggers is going to change slightly. So we had said 30% above the bottom of the wells for both, um, sorry, 30% above minimum threshold and 30% above shallow, um, uh, shallow uh, municipal wells um, with within disadvantaged communities, uh, and so they're they are working on a very specific approach. It's going to deviate somewhat from um, thirty percent, and so unfortunately, Aaron's not here to provide 
where they're headed, but it's a, it's a move um, that's intended, I think, both to just streamline. So we're, we're being uniform across the board and also I think more conservative. So, um, so anyway, so uh, stay tuned. We'll have Aaron um, uh, present the, the, this should all be wrapped up by the next, um, next committee meeting. So stay tuned to, uh, for a detail about uh, those triggers, right? So that should be implementable by the next time we meet. Um, of course, you can still always go to the arc view map, um, which is linked to here. Um, if you want to spend time looking at the location of um, the current trading zone boundaries, disadvantaged communities and representative monitoring wells. Um, that update I can provide a little more detail about uh, one uh, an update I can provide a little more detail about is the modification of the trading zones. So uh, the map will be ready within a week. Um, and so if you keep if you keep going back to this, the link here to the ArcView map, um, that will have been updated uh, very shortly. And what ended up happening was that there was a, there were a handful of analysis zones that did not have a representative monitoring well in them. And so the engineering team has already identified which ones those are and has a draft set of trading modified trading zone boundaries that will ensure that every single trading zone has a representative monitoring well. Uh, and so and we, we, we actually, it's so close to being done. We almost thought we'd have it today, uh, but we don't. So you can uh, stay tuned to the next committee meeting or you can uh, visit that ArcView map here in the next week uh, and that should be updated. Uh, but in order to implement those triggers, whether it's the disadvantaged community or the minimum threshold trigger, obviously we need a representative monitoring well in each trading zone. Um, and so that's it. So um, that's all the detail I have about those. That's more a uh, stay tuned, unfortunately, than, than concrete information. Um, you know, opening the floor to committee members and to the public. Is there anything else that's sort of top of mind that you want to um, discuss in this setting with the committee? Yes, I'll. This is Kelsey talking. Uh, why I kind of wanted to come, we're actually, I'm a landowner. We are in mid Korea and greater Korea. We're just right on the line, right? And if I'm understanding correctly, currently we cannot make transfers from mid Korea. Say we have credits from surface water credits in mid Korea to transfer that to the greater Korea. I'm if I'm understanding correctly, that's currently how it's set up. And I guess kind of more probably with the the trading zone areas, I'm just, I mean, we're within a mile, two mile. I mean, just opening up that conversation of the possibility, we being a mutual owner as well, could there be a possibility of us being able to transfer just from our, our own to and that's a GSA question, actually. Yeah. Okay. Greater yeah. You wouldn't. Greater you wouldn't want to do that inside the market, anyway. Plus, I don't agree greater with rate. the concurrence with the other GSA. Okay. And I don't know if that's fair. It's not yet, yet, but it's yeah. It's certainly being okay. discussed. Aaron understands. There's yeah an issue there. Okay. You're down the street from me, so I <laughs> you're so where where Van Nichols is? Yeah, that's me. Okay. Yeah. And what was your last name? Lang and Decker. Lang Decker. Yeah. So Nick. Oh that. Okay. okay. Anything Thanks. else? Anything else on people's minds? Um I guess, Matt, just a general question. Do you think this is going to be done in a place to actually run an auction in November? Uh, I think it, it's it's absolutely possible. Um, what would the Actually, the thing I don't have as much visibility into is whether the legal team and the GSA leadership have bandwidth to, you know, pass ordinances or resolutions in order to authorize all of this, um, but the infrastructure can certainly be in place 
Um, and so uh, it will be on, it'll really be then in the hands of a GSA um, uh, board. I know Aaron is um, very, very interested in making this available in mid Kuya um, by November. So that's our goal. And, uh, and at least on our end, we're on track to, to make that possible. Um, I don't, again, I don't know what it would take um, in terms of GSA bandwidth, GSA board bandwidth. Thank you. All right, if there's no other comments, feel free to reach out to us by email um, between now and the next committee meeting. Uh, and we will be in touch with meeting agendas and- um, When is the next meeting? Review. When's the next Great. meeting? Kendriel, do you have that on your calendar? We haven't put it on the calendars yet, but following our schedule, it would be Wednesday the 20th. Does Wednesday the 20th work for everybody? Listen for me, but I'll make some changes. <laughs> okay. All right. So we will we will tentatively plan the 20th and send notification. Awesome. Thank you, everybody.